Thank you very much. I'd like to thank uh, Kita and Kim and Chang for inviting me to speak with you this afternoon. I'd like to use my time to talk about some specific case studies, concrete examples taken from the files of U.S. Customs so that you can see some examples of how specific companies got into trouble or struggles or issues with U.S. Customs. And hopefully these will be uh, lessons for you and for your customers so that you can avoid these same kinds of troubles and have your goods move smoothly into the United States. And the examples that we will use will be some, from some of the other FTAs that the United States already has in place with other countries. I'm going to move very quickly through a very small overview of some basic principles about importing into the United States that I think everyone should know who's involved in goods going to the United States. Then we'll do case studies. Um, I'll move as quickly as I can through those and leave as much time as possible for my colleagues' presentation uh, and also for question and answer. So when we talk about importing into the United States, we must start with U.S. Customs and Border Protection, CBP. It's part of our Department of Homeland Security, which was established after the attacks of September 11th, and it is the one import agency to whom all importers into the United States must report and declare their goods, no matter what they're importing. If they're importing cars that may have regulations from the Department of Transportation, or chemicals that may have regulations under our Environmental Protection Agency, even if these other agencies may also have regulations, all importers must declare their goods to our single CBP. And I said importers must do this, and I said so for a very particular reason. It's because that's what it says in our U.S. law. And I've put the provision of our U.S. law up there, and you can see it's very specific. And it tells you exactly who needs to do what and how. Our U.S. law says that the importer of record, that's who, the importer of record, for itself or through an agent, meaning a customs broker, but it's still itself, the importer, who must do this. The importer of record what? What must they do? They shall. It's a very important word in U.S. law. Not they could or they might or they should. They shall, which means they must. What must they do? Well, they must make entry. They must complete the entry by giving our U.S. customs all of the information on value, classification, rate of duty, everything that applies to those goods so that CBP can do its job to assess duties, collect statistics, and determine whether any other requirement of law needs to be met. That's a lot. That's a big burden for importers. So how can importers know whether they have done enough? When can they stop? Well, our law goes on to say how they must do this. It says using reasonable care. Simple, right? You all know what reasonable care means, right? No. U.S. Customs doesn't even really know what, you, what reasonable care means sometimes. U.S. Customs said in one of its publications, despite the seemingly simple connotation, this responsibility defies easy explanation. What did they mean by that? They meant they couldn't give one explanation because there are so many different kinds of goods that come into the United States. If you're importing a chemical or an automobile or textiles, the important information is going to be different. And it's up to the importer under that reasonable care standard to do, the, do its research, do its homework, and figure out what's important under our laws, what laws apply in the United States, and bring them forward, volunteer them to U.S. Customs. All right, so now you know who is responsible, who bears the burden, and what they must do. So how do you apply that in your commercial dealings? Well, the first thing you should do is have a negotiation about who is going to be the importer of record. Don't just let it fall to the INCO terms. Don't just let it be assumed. Make it explicit, because this is a real burden, particularly as we have seen from our excellent speakers earlier today, compliance with FTA rules matters. There are a lot of steps that need to be covered. And in the United States, that's the importer of record. Put specifically in your contracts, in your purchase orders, in your invoices, who shall be the importer of record? 
and who shall bear this burden? Because after there is a problem and after U.S. Customs has issued a big bill, that's not the time to have a fight about it. That's not a good day for anybody. The other thing to make sure when you're setting up the relationship between the manufacturer and the importer, make a decision commercially about who will be responsible if there is a denial of an FTA claim and who will keep the records. I know that the importer has a responsibility to keep records under U.S. law. The Korean exporter, particularly one who certifies, has the responsibility to keep records. But that says what their responsibilities are to their respective governments. Commercially, there's a relationship there. What if the importer says to the manufacturer, you've not provided enough, we want more. What if the manufacturer says, this is enough, we, we need to stop, we've given you enough supporting information. The parties should allocate that responsibility in their contracts and reduce that friction when there's a struggle with U.S. Customs. Well, now that you've decided who the importer of record will be, what should, what should that importer of record do? Well, exercise reasonable care, of course. You're all reasonable care experts now. You knew that already. But how should you do that mechanically? What steps should you actually take? It's easy for me to say that standard of law. Well, one thing to do, I know it sounds simplistic, but it, it works. There should be a central point of compliance, an office or a person at the importer who will be responsible to make sure that the information declared to U.S. Customs is correct and complete and accurate. Don't leave it up to a freight company or some other person. We'll talk about uh, some of those other people involved in a second. That office should have a plan for record keeping. That office should be responsible on behalf of the importer. How shall we answer? Where shall we get the records if we get a question from U.S. Customs? Do we already have the records from the manufacturer? Do we have an agreement in place to get the records from the manufacturer? The other thing that office should do is remember that CBP acceptance is not CBP approval. And what do I mean by that? I mean that you can have shipments coming into the United States over and over and over and over again, declared the same way over and over again, and U.S. Customs may never complain. But because they never complain, that does not mean that they have made a decision that this is the correct way this merchandise should be declared. It just means they've never complained. Now, if the only reason that the importing company believes it's correctly declaring its merchandise, the only reason, if the only reason is that we've always done it this way, we never looked into it really, but we've always done it this way, and so it must be correct, in my personal opinion, that does not strike me as reasonable care. But if the company has a, a central office or a person who is responsible who has looked at the standards for these products and said, yes, I've reviewed the rules and those standards seem to fit the conditions of this transaction, and we've always done it this way and it's never been a problem, that starts to sound much more like reasonable care to me. Another good responsibility to consider for this central office or person at the importer is to manage brokers and sureties for every import transaction into the United States, every big substantial commercial transaction, usually there's a broker and a surety. So let's talk about them for just one second, then we'll move on to case studies. Every commercial import transaction into the United States, there's three parties all talking to U.S. Customs at once. There's the importer, we've talked about them already. They have the responsibility. But they're usually speaking through a customs broker it's not the customs broker's obligation to act with reasonable care. An importer that says to customs, we're sorry we made a mistake, but the broker made the mistake. Customs will say, no, it's not the broker's responsibility, it's yours, and so is the penalty yours if the mistake is made under our U.S. law. So what can an importer do to show reasonable care and reduce the possibility of getting one of these penalties from U.S. Customs, even if there's a mistake? Well, one thing they can do is make sure to work together with the broker, manage that relationship with the broker, give the broker written instructions, have periodic meetings with the broker, make sure to have records that those meetings took place so if U.S. Customs asks, the company can show, perhaps we made a mistake, but even if we did, we were exercising reasonable care. We were trying to do the right thing. And so even if there are additional duties owing, there should not be any additional penalties on top of those duties. 
The other party involved in every import transaction is a surety. Every importer into the United States must purchase a surety bond. That surety bond is in favor of the U.S. government. So if the importer fails in some procedural way to comply with the rules or doesn't pay some amount charged by U.S. Customs, then US, the U.S. government can turn to that surety and say, we'll get the money from the surety. We'll let the surety chase after and sue the importer. This is protection for our U.S. government. But the sureties get a report of all of the shipments that have been declared under their bonds. So if you, your company or your customers are having a struggle about some issue with U.S. Customs, the surety will know. And if the surety believes that there is some risk, the surety might, might, pay U.S. Customs and sue the importer. Now you've got two problems. So in some situations, it makes sense if there's an issue, a struggle with U.S. Customs, consider contacting the surety and letting that surety know, don't you worry, we have it all under control, we're talking to Customs, we're going to work through this, we stand behind this, you don't have to do anything. That way you, you continue to have just one problem. All right, that was the world's fastest overview of some very basic principles for importing into the United States. But I did that so quickly because I want to get to case studies. So let's, let's talk about case studies, uh, specific examples from the files of U.S. Customs. We'll start with classification examples. And of course, in the United States, we use the harmonized system. Like most countries, we use the, uh, our version is called the Harmonized Tariff Schedule of the United States based on the harmonized system published by the World Customs Organization. Um, but of course, under an FTA uh, agreement, classification is doubly important because now not only does the importer have to get the classification correct for the finished good coming into the United States, which has always been true, you always needed to do that. Now, particularly when you have origin governed by a tariff shift rule under a free trade agreement, you have to get the classification right for the input materials. You have to have both ends right. And if both ends are not correct, your analysis won't be correct. Your decision and your declaration about whether the goods qualify for chorus FTA treatment won't be correct and won't be properly supported. Well, one way a company can protect itself is to get a ruling. We have a terrific ruling system in the United States. Uh, if a product is critically important to your company or your relationship with your supplier or your customer, go to customs, ask for a ruling, and then you can have certainty. You can have real certainty that this is the correct way this product should be treated, and the local port officials will love you. They will love you because they don't have to worry about it anymore. When your goods come in, the ruling is presented, and they say, oh, that's excellent. We'll just follow the ruling. Customs uh, ruling system, you can see how, uh, how expansive it is. If you go to the U.S. Customs website, there's a searchable system of ruling results called CROSS. And in that system, you can research. It's keyword searchable. And you can research other situations like yours, what companies were told by U.S. Customs. And when you're trying to prove that your analysis is correct, classification was right, tariff shift was correct, one of the ways you can support yourself in that analysis and defend against any question from U.S. Customs is to show, well, we found this ruling, and, and we followed it, and it's the same situation, and here's why. And many of the examples, most of the examples that you will see, I've taken directly from this rulings database system, and I've given you the citations. Uh, you can look them up and, and read the rulings uh, if you'd like to learn more about some of the cases that we will talk about now in case studies. First case study, classification. This issue involved uh, oil capsules, uh, fish oil or primrose oil, that sort of thing, dietary supplements. The raw materials to make these capsules had been imported from outside Canada and brought in, and the capsules were made in Canada and then imported into the United States under our NAFTA. And the importer classified the goods as 2106 food preparations and duty-free under the NAFTA. The local port officials, Notice a lot of this happens at the local port level. It doesn't require some of the more elaborate provisions of an FTA where U.S. Customs comes to Korea and verifies that that will happen. But the local port officials reclassified the goods 
under 1515 as other vegetable fats and oils, denied the NAFTA claim, and said, no, in fact, 3.8% duties and marking duties, we'll talk about marking duties in a few minutes, all were owing on these products. And the importer went and looked up the tariff shift rule and found that it was the same for 2106 and for 1515. It said, a change from any other chapter. It's the same. So the importer protested. And the protest went all the way to U.S. Customs Headquarters. And what did headquarters do? Headquarters started out by saying, as you must, under tariff shift analysis, the finished goods are classified how? They found they were classified in 1515. And they said, yes, the correct tariff shift rule is from another chapter, but look at the ingredients now, once you make that decision. There were different production processes for different kinds of capsules. When it was oil that was imported into Canada, oil was classified in 1515, and capsules were made. And the capsules were 1515, no change. So when they came to the United States, they hadn't been made into a product of Canada. But when seeds were imported into Canada, the seeds were properly classified in 1207. So the seeds came into Canada as 1207. They came out of Canada into the United States, 1515. That's a change. And the protest was granted as to those goods. But the reason this importer got into a struggle in the first place, it didn't have its classifications correct at both ends, and it didn't apply the rule correctly. You're not going to let that happen. Classification study number two. You're about to hear the extent of my Spanish. This is Crema Latina from Nicaragua. This is cream that you put on your dessert. Um, there were over 100 entries of this product, and I have to say this importer did not exercise reasonable care. Sometimes they classified the goods in 0405. Sometimes they classified them in 1515. If you're classifying the same product, different shipments, different numbers, you know there's a problem. And you should know there's a problem, and this importer did not. But the importer said every time, qualifies under the Dominican Republic Central American Free Trade Agreement, that they never forgot. They always claimed duty-free treatment. The local port officials reviewed these shipments and said, no, we think the correct classification is 1901, and duty-free treatment does not apply. The importer protested. In the course of reviewing the protest, Customs asked some questions. U.S. Customs asked some questions about how the good was made. And one of the points that came out was that the product contained powdered milk from the United States. But who cares? It's from the United States. It doesn't matter, right? Wrong. Customs headquarters found that, yes, again, the port was right. Classification in 1901 was correct. But when you looked closely at the rule that applied to goods in that classification, it was found that there was a separate origin rule for those goods. It was noted with a P plus in our rules rather than a letter P. That was the code. And it said that in that case, U.S. origin goods are not counted as part of originating materials. And so in this case, the tariff shift rule was a change from any other chapter. Did the input, inputs change from any other chapter? Yeah, yeah, that's us. Uh, is it a good of heading 1901? Yeah, yeah, that's us. Containing over 10% by weight of milk solid? Yeah, that's us. Uh-oh. May not contain a non-originating good of Chapter 4. The milk solids were properly classified in Chapter 4. You've got to classify your inputs correctly. And they were of U.S. origin, but under this rule, therefore, were non-originating. And so the protest was denied, and duty was assessed at a dollar per kilo and 13% duties over 121 shipments. That was a bad day. You're not going to let that happen to your products. Let's move on and talk about country of origin do some case studies about country of origin. And what I mean is country of origin marking. And some of these rules are not specific to the FTA, but I think they are important for companies importing into the United States. We talked about country of origin for qualifying for the FTA already 
under classification. Let's talk about the marking rules that we have in the United States because they cause a lot of struggle with our U.S. Customs. The rule says that anything of foreign origin, anything that's not of U.S. origin, must be marked legibly, indelibly, and permanently. It's a lot of conditions there. So that the ultimate purchaser, whoever will ultimately use it, not a buyer or a reseller or a trading company who will actually use the goods so that that person can receive the label and make a decision about whether or not to buy the product. They might not want to buy products from that particular country. And our law says they should get the opportunity to choose. As a result of that lengthy requirement that you saw, there are a lot of issues that come up. One is, in the United States, if products are sufficiently converted, if they are substantially transformed in the United States, after that conversion, they no longer have a requirement to carry that foreign country of origin. They are released from it, and they can remain silent. Notice, however, this is not the same thing as a product being made in the USA. You are released from foreign country of origin. The product can remain silent if it wants to. But that does not mean that the product then has the right to carry the label made in the USA. Made in the USA rules are a whole other set of rules that are voluntary and that are regulated by our Federal Trade Commission. And it would be my pleasure to come back and talk to you for a very long seminar about Federal Trade Commission rules, but not today. You saw in the requirements that the country of origin marketing has to be legible and indelible and permanent and has to be conveyed to the ultimate purchaser. So we get into a lot of struggles with U.S. Customs about language and size and placement. How should the country of origin marking look? If there's some other address, some other place name, like a company address, that's different from the country of origin, you have to use language like made in or product of or similar language other than just putting simply the country name. We have exceptions for packages. Sometimes you can mark the package instead of the good itself. We get into struggles with U.S. Customs about whether the mark is indelible or permanent enough if you put it on a tag or a sticker or some kind of label instead of marking the good itself. These are all issues that can really hold up shipments and create delay and expense for your goods or for your relationship with your customers. One more thing about country of origin marking, and then we'll get on to a couple of case studies. Um, Marking duties. I mentioned before marking duties. Goods that are not properly marked when they come into the United States can be subject to an additional duty of 10%. That's a duty, not a penalty. Penalties, we'll talk about those in a couple of minutes. Penalties are something that can be reduced by U.S. Customs and Customs discretion. You can go to Customs uh, with a good lawyer and you can say, oh, please, Customs, please, I'm so sorry. Reduce the penalty. And Customs has the authority to lower that penalty if you give them a good argument. But these are duties. Customs does not have the discretion. And if the goods are found to be improperly marked, they must. They must assess an additional 10%. Let's talk about case studies. Country of origin marking case study. A baby seat. Again, not an FDA case, but I think it's a very good example. This particular baby seat, you, know, you hook it on the table so the child can sit in the seat and be up at the table. The seat was marked designed in Italy, made in China. Not bad. The front of the box that this seat came in had the company name and an Italy address, very big on the front of the box. And down in the corner, over on the side, made in China. <laughs> For Inglesina Baby SPA. It also, on the two sides of the box, it had, again, company name and Italy address. This was the subject of some controversy, and it went to U.S. Customs Headquarters. You already know what's coming. Customs Headquarters said, yes, you can mark the package. You all saw the exception for package marking in some of the earlier slides. But because there was the Italy address, the companies couldn't just say China. They had to say made in China or product of China or similar language. And U.S. Customs said, that little small marking in the corner, too small, couldn't be read. It was being dominated by the other language on the front of the box. And it was misleading 
because you had a mark on the front of the box but not on the sides and even though you had more addresses on the sides. Customs went on to say, made in China for Ingolcina baby is permitted if you, if it is put everywhere the Italy address appears and in the same size font. Look at this level of detail. Customs is giving instructions about the font size of the packaging. This can really hold up a shipment if the font size is incorrect. You're not going to let this happen to your products. Case study number two, sockets. This is under our, uh, under an FTA, under our NAFTA. U.S. steel bars, U.S. origin steel was sent to Taiwan. And in Taiwan, the steel bars were cut and polished and engraved, and then they were sent to Mexico where they were polished and engraved. And in Mexico, the word Mexico, the origin word Mexico, was sunk into the metal. The importer also, before shipping to the United States, realized, eh, that's probably not right. It's probably not Mexican origin. That's right. The work they did in Mexico under the NAFTA did not change the country of origin of the good. It didn't meet the tariff shift rule. So those goods still carried Taiwanese origin when they arrived in the United States. And so this importer thought ahead. This importer said, okay, I'm going to put a label, a sticker, and I'm going to cover the word Mexico. And the sticker said, made in Taiwan. All solved, right? No. The local port officials, again, said, oh, this is no good. We can't accept this. This is deceptive marking. These goods should be seized. It would cause confusion. It was a misrepresentation in the U.S. marketplace. And their concern was that the label could be removed after importation. It could be peeled off. Thankfully, the port did the right thing and requested internal advice, guidance from U.S. Customs Headquarters. And I was shocked by this result. U.S. Customs Headquarters agreed, yes, country of origin is not changed in Mexico. It was changed in Taiwan. Bars were changed into Taiwanese origin. Then they came to Mexico, didn't meet the tariff shift rule under NAFTA, so they're still of Taiwanese origin. And yes, we here at U.S. Customs prefer when the goods are marked themselves right on the body of the good, but these stickers were legible, indelible, and permanent. They met the conditions of our law, and it completely covered the word Mexico. And our U.S. Customs said, it is as if the word Mexico never existed. I was shocked by this result. It was too reasonable. But this is what they said. Another area of case studies that we should talk about, we've talked already today about the imported directly requirement under many of the FTAs, and it's in the chorus FTA as well. Let's, uh, let's look at a couple quick examples of how that imported directly rule works or doesn't work. Under our Chile FTA in the United States, sheepskin garments were really tightly boxed. I don't know why. And they were sent to Canada, and in Canada they were opened up and they were unpacked and vacuumed, nice, put on a hanger with a bag. They didn't change the garment. They didn't do anything to the clothes. They just cleaned it and put it on a hanger. U.S. Customs said no. That's not direct shipment. The goods came into Canada. They were worked on in some way. All of the work that had gone into making these clothes in Chile, under the Chile FTA, denied. Similarly, there was a case recent, uh, in 2002, excuse me, 2002 case of T-shirts, T-shirt material that was cut in the United States and sent to Honduras. T-shirts were made in Honduras and they were going to get shipped to the United States. But on the way, they went to Mexico. And they were printed in Mexico with designs on the front. You already know the answer. U.S. Customs said no. Not direct shipment. They came into Mexico, you did some work on them. Doesn't matter that you didn't really change the t-shirt. FDA treatment denied. However, 
We had an example in 2010 of fishing tackle from Haiti. Stopped at the uh, Dominican Republic and went into a foreign trade zone. It stayed in the control of government customs officials in the Dominican Republic. And therefore, even though it had stopped on the way, it was still qualified under the free trade agreement. It still got that treatment. They packaged it with other materials, and it still got free trade agreement treatment because it was in a free trade zone. Similarly, automotive harnesses. We had a case in 2010. Automotive harnesses that were made in Honduras that went to the United States. They moved through the United States on a bonded shipment. They went into Mexico, and they went into a bonded warehouse. That's okay. That's direct shipment because they were always bonded. They never entered the United States. They never entered the, the commerce of Mexico. They were covered by government officials. That still qualified as direct shipment. I told you we would talk about penalties. Penalties come in the United States uh, for just about any kind of error. Penalty is the, 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 the method by which U.S. Customs likes to enforce our rules. These are penalties, as I said, in addition to the duties, and they can be applied to shipments over the past five years. Even if Customs has said nothing about those shipments over the past five years, they can decide one day to reach back five years. And this is where the reasonable care rule comes into play, because if a company exercises reasonable care under our law, it should, be not, it should not be subject to penalties. Exercising reasonable care means the company was not negligent, and that is the first level of penalties. If a company is negligent, meaning, well, they tried, but they made a mistake, they got it wrong, they could have tried harder. In that case, Customs has the authority to assess penalties at 0 0.5 times the duties, up to two times the duties, in addition to whatever duties are found to be owing. The next level or type of penalties that we have under our law is gross negligence. This means the company says, ah, we don't care. Whatever it is, it is. We, we're not going to worry about it. We'll just put some information on the paperwork. That's gross negligence. And Customs has the authority to assess penalties of two times or four times, and I should say, uh, like negligence, if the, if the error did not result in a loss of duties, the penalty possibility also exists. And for gross negligence, it's 20 to 40 percent of the value, although thankfully, as a U.S. taxpayer, I have to say, U.S. Customs does not typically pursue penalties against errors that did not affect duty collection. Every once in a while, they do. The last kind of penalty is fraud, which means the importers actually intended to cheat the U.S. government. Nobody here will ever be involved in fraud, so we don't need to talk about that. So we can talk about our, our case study, and indeed our last case study. Um, and it's about penalties. Uh, this is under our NAFTA, and I think it is a terrific example of all the things that you can do wrong, and all the things that you're not going to do wrong. It was a company called John Roberts, and in 1997 and 98, they imported blankets into the United States. And the company claimed that these blankets were woven because they were woven in a certain way, they qualified for NAFTA duty-free treatment. The important point here is that they were not knit. Two years later, U.S. Customs reviewed the paperwork and said, eh, you know, we think they might have been knit. And if they were knit, they wouldn't be eligible for NAFTA. And so we are proposing to issue a penalty uh, we're proposing to collect $121,000 in past duties, plus penalties under negligence at two times for $243,000 for a grand total surprise for this company of $364,000. A bad day. But I said it's a pre-penalty notice, which is the way our system works in the United States. Customs sends out a pre-penalty notice and says, we are proposing a penalty, we're considering it. What do you think, importer? John Roberts did not respond. 
to the pre-penalty notice. I'm sure they didn't have a central point for customs compliance. And if there is one thing that I can give you today, always respond. Always respond, always respond. Bad things happen when you don't respond. So what did U.S. Customs do when it got no response? It issued the penalty notice, of course. We proposed this penalty here at Customs, now we're going forward with the penalty. The next month, in 2001, Customs issued a demand to John Roberts' surety. Remember we said, think about the surety? Now John Roberts had two problems. Finally, in May of 2001, John Roberts responded, thank goodness, to U.S. Customs, and they said, well, the supplier was responsible to collect up the import information. You know that's wrong. You're experts in reasonable care. You know that's wrong. It's the importer's job. And secondly, John Roberts said that the supplier had relied on a ruling that told the supplier that this was the correct way to classify the goods. They didn't have a copy of the ruling. They didn't have their own ruling on the product. It was not a good argument. So what did Customs do? Customs said, we're going forward with the penalty. We're not mitigating in any way. We're not reducing this penalty for you. You haven't given us a good argument. And of course, John Roberts did not pay. So where did they end up? At our U.S. Court of International Trade, where all of our customs disputes go in New York. And John Roberts got served with papers from the court saying it was being sued by the U.S. government to collect the duties and the penalties. And the president of John Roberts, I love this response, he sent back a one-sentence response saying, we're not responsible. It wasn't our fault. You can imagine that the court did not think very much of this response. So the clerk of the court sent a letter back. It's never a good sign when you're getting letters from the clerk of the court. The clerk of the court sent a letter back to John Roberts and said, you really need to be represented by a lawyer, one who is admitted to our court to answer these charges. And the president responded again. And he said, the company is insolvent. We have no money. We are requesting a public defender, a lawyer be appointed and given to us by, uh, by this court. And the Court of International Trade responded and said, you've watched too much television. Public defenders are only given in criminal cases. This is not a criminal case. This is a civil case. John Roberts responded by sending its financial information to the court. To the court, not to the judge, not to custom, to the court. Of course, what happened is that John Roberts stopped corresponding and the court entered a default judgment against John Roberts in the amount of the duties and the penalties. I assume that this fully wrecked any chances of the company ever recovering. I assume it fully wrecked the finances of the officers and shareholders of the company, whatever they may have been. Why? Because they didn't exercise reasonable care. They didn't have supporting documents to support their NAFTA claim. They didn't respond promptly to U.S. Customs. All things that you will do. I will be happy to answer questions after my colleague's presentation. And after we're done today, I will be around the hall. Please uh, feel free to come up to me. Uh, thank you very much for your time and attention. I appreciate it greatly.